tonight's uh, title is Coming Home to Equanimity. In one of the verses of the Dhammapada, the, the Buddha uh, teachings, the Buddha described a mind filled with equanimity as abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. If you're familiar with the Brahma Viharas or divine abodes, also known as the four immeasurables, this might be repetitive, but for some of you, it might be new information. So I'm kind of um, heading down the middle here. Likely you're familiar with both the Pali words, the words um, of uh, the, the language and the teachings, the Buddhist teachings, and the English words. So the first word is metta, which is loving kindness. Uh, the second, karuna, or compassion. The third, mudita, appreciative joy. It's really joy for others. And the fourth, upeka, which is equanimity. Tonight, we'll, well, it's not tonight, everywhere. Tonight, today, good day, good afternoon. We'll focus on uh, equanimity. There are a couple of different aspects to this term. And I, you know, some people think of being calm and balanced. There's a little more to it than I want to share. One is, yeah, staying balanced and staying centered, staying in the middle. Bhikkhu Bodhi, one of our revered teachers in the Vipassana tradition, says it's being there in the middleness, the middleness of things, the impartial balanced. The other way to view it is the actual translation of the word upeka, meaning to look over, not to overlook now, but to look over, to gain a, go up to a vantage point from above. It doesn't mean to bypass, but to gain a bird's eye view of our situation, causes and conditions, our experiences. It's the bigger picture that would allow us to see who we are, who others are. It opens up to with us to wisdom, patience, and uh, without judgment. So when I first, um, I lived in Savannah, Georgia for several years. Those of you that are familiar with the South, it's pretty flat. I moved there from British Columbia, the Gulf Islands, Boston, the Caribbean with mountains, Canada, and I moved to this place that was basically a swamp. I felt so low and I used to go, I just didn't have a vantage point. The only place I could go regularly was the top of the garage where I parked and try to get some sort of vantage point. And I remember feeling so much better when I could see a little more than just those, of course, wonderful architecture and trees. But I think of equanimity, of looking over as going up high to that tree. I even visualize it sometimes. It's climbing, like climbing to the top of a tree or uh, to the top of a mountain to get this view. We always have an opportunity to take in the entirety of our situation and make decisions based on this broader context. You can see how landscapes change, that it will, you know, you could see how things move. The ocean moves into the sand and then up to, up to the ground and the trees. And then the third aspect, which I, not everyone says or teaches, but I think there's a third aspect. There's the balanced, there's looking over, to look over. I think the third aspect, which kind of just rounds it all out, is this aspect of impartiality this spaciousness, this openness that opens up the perspective to even want to climb to the top of that tree, to even realize that we need some balancing. This spaciousness opens us up to the brain, all the malleability of the brain, to new tributaries or rivulets that can, we can now carve out. We know that all the trauma carved really deep ones. Let's create some new tributaries with our thinking. This broader view is wisdom. It allows us to cultivate the divine abodes. For example, it tempers. So with metta, lo expressing loving kindness to all, uh, we could get swept away with obsession, with clinging, with possessiveness. And with equanimity, with this balance, we can be and express loving kindness without the attachment to the outcome. This is the biggest lesson in life, right? 
embodying these three aspects, the impartiality, looking over, the balance, allows us to grow. It allows us to exercise that muscle uh, by really trying to bring them all in to all of the, the Brahma Viharas. But simply learning about equanimity, me talking about it, doesn't create it. It's really applying this. Think of it as a toolbox that you pull out. Think of the breathing as a toolbox, the stillness, the sitting that you bring out when you need to cultivate that wisdom. And wisdom is needed for all of the divine abodes. So even though equanimity, uh, upekka, is the fourth that we usually study in succession, it's, um, it's, they're all interwoven. So it's not linear. Think of it more of a helix, right? They're moving around each other, each of the divine abodes, each of those qualities all the time, bringing them, bringing balance to all of those. So when we talk about balance to all of those, it could be compassion. Okay, if we go to the extreme with compassion, it can become overwhelming. It can be grief, it can be pity. And we can get so pulled over into that sense of compassion that we lose a sense of ourself. We lose how much the, the knowledge of how much agency we really have to be able to change someone else's life or their situation or stop a war. There's so much suffering when we lose that sense of agency. It doesn't mean we're not responding. Okay, there's a difference between reacting and reactivity and responding. Equanimity is so important that Buddha had to say it so many times throughout all the teachings, and it shows up in uh, it shows up in the ten paramis: mindfulness, investigating, energy, joy, relaxation, concentration and equanimity. It shows up there. It shows up in the seven factors of enlightenment or the seven factors of awakening. Mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, relaxation and tranquility, concentration and equanimity. It's the foundation of all the other Brahma Viharas. Dura Williams, who's one of our spirit rock teachers and also teaches in other places like Insight Meditation Society, in Barrie, Massachusetts. I love what she says. She's a therapist and a teacher. She says that equanimity is the bass drum. Isn't that wonderful? Equanimity is the bass drum that carries that beat throughout our teaching, our learning. I love that imagery. In the Dhammapada again, the sacred scriptures of Buddha, the Buddha says, as a solid mass of rock, is not stirred by the wind, so a sage is not moved by praise or blame. As a deep lake is clear and undisturbed, so a sage becomes clear. Upon hearing the Dharma, virtuous people always let go. They don't prattle about pleasures and desires, touched by happiness and then by suffering. The sage shows no sign of being elated or depressed. Beautiful teaching, and we say it and learn it with some caution. It could be interpreted, perhaps, in a way that's not supportive. While some people may think of equanimity as being a state of being flat or neutral or aloof, it isn't. It's being able to see, understand, feel, embrace the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows and stand somewhere in the middleness of it as best as we can. So it's not apathy or it's not being aloof. It is, there's warmth to it. There's an energy with it. It's an action, it's activities that work towards the good of oneself and for others. That teaching that I read about the Buddha equating it as a mountain, 
unmoved by winds. I think that's a wonderful uh, image for stability. I like to think of it as a little more active, a little more energy. And there is energy in a mountain. I think of it as a dance, the way bamboo moves. If you've been in a bamboo grove or if you have it growing in your yard or you've even seen it, it moves with the wind. It may move in a storm and touch the ground on one side. It may move back and touch the other side. And it's because of these deep roots, these deep intertwined roots that run throughout the ground, that touch the other bamboo, that form this anchor, like a ship's ballast, right? It forms this anchor that it's able to withstand those winds. It's able to withstand that movement back and forth and settle in the middle. As humans, we're programmed to react to stimulus. You've heard Rick say this over and over, our fight or flight, our survival qualities that arise when we're threatened, and they may remain activated when there's no imminent danger. Okay, they remain out there. So you're gonna to say to me, this is one of the most unusual metaphors that I've heard in a talk, but I'll start with children. You know, when children hurt themselves, they get angry at their siblings or their friends and they don't want to play with them and they cry. And somehow they on their own come back to that center. They might go into a sibling's room and say, I'm sorry, might not, but do you want to play? They pick themselves up off the bicycle and rub their knees after being comforted or not or comforting themselves. They have a natural sense. Animals do too. They shake themselves, right? They shake themselves when they need to bring themselves back. As humans, and as we get older, we, I think we lose that sense, that, um, what do you call it? Being able to bounce back, that buoyancy as quickly. And so we have to make it intentional. We have to make it intentional, recognizing all the signs, recognizing that scraped knee, that anger, that pain, that grief, and moving towards. So here's the, here's the weird part that might sound weird. I call this, and I label this, this theory, you can quote me, the stretched out underwear syndrome. You know when that underwear, that elastic stretches way out. And as we get older, we pile on, we stretch it out further. Our personal traumas, our illnesses, our family's traumas, the world. <laughs> the country, politics, it just goes out, out, out. And um, so that's why I say this may be a strange image, but I'm big on imagery. We just are not able to bring it back in. And so we have to do it intentionally. Okay, so we sometimes, that's what I'm saying, we remain activated even after the imminent danger is gone, right? You may be worried about a loved one traveling through the snow or not getting there in time. And where are they? They arrive back in the house. They arrive safely. They call you and say, they, but you've remained up. Your activation, even though you know they're in a safe place, that activation remains high. So what we practice is not the reactivity, besides pulling out from the toolbox, but the response. Ah, oh, I'm so glad you're there. I'm so glad you're safe, as opposed to, oh my gosh, I thought you were this, I thought you were that. That's natural, but, and but, we can activate someone else too in our, in our responses. Like other divine abodes and Brahma Viharas, equanimity has a near enemy and a far enemy. Do you know what that is when we talk about a near enemy and a far enemy? So, okay, I see someone shaking here. So the near enemy is something that disguises itself as the virtue or the divine state. So take um, love or metta as an example. Metta is loving kindness to ourselves and to others, holding them, holding them in the highest. However, one of the near enemies could be, that could be disguised, right? You think of it as a, a scale or a continuum, could be um, uh, uh, obsession, 
clingingness, right? Attachment that we say it's because I really love them that I really want to control and dictate every aspect of this person's life. And that means I really love them. So it can disguise itself with this sense of attachment. That's me. the far enemy of metta, which is loving kindness, is just out and out cruelty. So if you think of it, the scale, you know, the scales when you, they've changed them so quickly, you'd go to the doctor and they would put you on the weight on the scale and move that little um, weight down, down, and you were hoping that um, the news will be good, right? So uh, it's, it's like moving it further to the middle. And there are times you're gonna cling and attach. And there are times you're gonna feel really distant and angry and maybe even want to commit a cruel act. But it's the equanimity, the wisdom, it's recognizing that, recognizing the sensations. Remember we talked about it during the meditation. What rises up for you when you think about that loved one or you think about someone? What rises up, those sensations, is a signal to bring you back to the metal. Does that make sense in terms of near? It's how it can disguise itself. So equanimity can disguise itself as aloofness. The near enemy is aloofness or indifference. Doesn't matter to me what happens. I'm just so cool and calm. Makes no difference to me. Okay, the far enemy on the other side of the scale is reactivity. React reacting with anger, with um, fear, with physical action or verbal action. And it's, again, it's the kind of the real opposite of equanimity. We want to respond and not react. Now, there are times when you have to react. You have to swerve the car as someone swerves their car into your lane. You have to grab a child from running into the street. You have to act quickly. And when there is imminent danger, however, often we're constantly reacting to everything. Do you ever notice yourself rushing and there is no place you have to get at a certain time? It's just a habit or eating so quickly because that's what you do and you're really, you're okay. You've got enough time. It's that, it's that elevated reactivity that we want to bring down. So, for all of the Brahma Viharas, there's a near and a far enemy. With mudita, that appreciative joy where you're just so happy for someone, the near enemy is sort of uh, disingenuous, uh, just being disingenuous, you know, like, oh, that's really nice. I moved from the South, and if you live in the South, you know, people say, that's really nice, dear, or bless your heart. But they don't especially, or not especially blessing my heart. It's just to say. And the far enemy, someone gets something, you're a writer, and you've been trying to publish a book, or you want your grandchildren to come home or someone to visit you, and then someone says, oh, I've published my book. And you say, that's wonderful, and you really mean it. Or you say, that's wonderful, because you don't want to sound mean. Or you're just out and out envious. And envy is the far enemy. When we feel threatened or we don't have enough, often the far enemy is that. For Mudita. So it's not pushing away the aversion. Remember I talked about the bamboo going all the way. You let it touch. The bamboo will touch the ground. You'll go from one side. There'll be times you'll be so deep in grief and another time you'll be so elated with joy. It's recognizing that it's impermanent. It's impermanent. They don't remain in that state forever. It's the clinging. So addiction is an example of clinging to the joy, clinging to the elation, clinging to the, to wanting it over and over and over again, that stimulation and remaining, you know, with, with touch to the ground on that side. What's ironic is often to bring about equanimity because there was grief and pain and sorrow and anger. Sometimes we go way over to the other side and it feels good, and we want it to feel good again. It could be any kind of addiction, whether it's uh, alcohol or drugs or food or just addiction to uh, social media. Whatever we think might anesthetize, that feeling of grief or pain can push us into it. 
So with equanimity or balance, it's not pushing away, but it's also not grabbing either. We're not pushing away the aversion and pretending it isn't there. And it's not grabbing, grabbing at what we think is joy. We accept that suffering or dukkha is pleasant, present in our lives. 10,000 joys, 10,000 sorrow, recognizing that it exists. And we have the tools, or we could grow the tools, cultivate the tools to apply the wisdom, the awareness of this, to be able to balance our life. And it's not overnight. Equanimity allows us to remain in the middle so we're not swept away by the eight worldly winds, the vicissitudes. Pleasure and pain, right? Pleasure and pain. We go towards pleasure and human nature. We go towards pleasure, pain, we push away. It's natural that we are humans. Gain and loss, failure or success. Praise and blame, we love the praise. And blame, we push away, even though it can be a tool for growth and wisdom. Fame and disrepute. You remember that saying, what goes up must come down? So it, these are the eight worldly winds that we live with. These are the joys and the sorrows. Equanimity and our practice and meditation does not prevent the winds from blowing. But it allows us to pause and respond rather than react in a way that will cause us more harm or call others harm. It's a portal to liberation, to that freedom, to letting go. In the Theravada tradition, we practice this with a sense of personal liberation. The paramis, the precepts, the Brahma Viharas. In the Mahayana, Zen, uh, which I was uh, kind of raised in because I was so young, we practice for the benefit of others. It doesn't mean we don't think about ourselves but it's more towards a collective liberation. And I like to think that we, can, that we do both. We practice for our personal and we practice for our collective liberation. And these require us to draw on a sense of equanimity. So how do we cultivate this quality? Okay. We do so by being present, what you're doing tonight through mindfulness, not just with meditation, but with our actions, whether it's washing the dishes, whether it's out for a walk, whether it's working, whether it's speaking to someone. We do it with connecting what's in, with what's going on inside of ourselves. And this is where the stillness and the coming home to our true nature comes about. Does that make sense? Coming home, stillness, coming home to our true nature. Remember I talked about kids knowing when to, uh, they not always, but most of the time they know or they might, you know, settle themselves in eventually. It's coming home to that true nature. It's being present and not remaining suspended in the past or overthinking the future, which we all love to do and we do it so easily. It's almost like a default, isn't it? We make up stories all the time, narratives about things that haven't even occurred. We make up stories about what we're going to encounter on the highway, in the grocery store, what we're going to encounter with that friend that we have to have a talk with, or that family member, or that partner. We're already thinking of our responses. And that's all it is for now. When we overthink the future and we move ourselves in the present, it's a story we made up. It doesn't mean we don't plan our future. We don't plan for paying the rent or paying our mortgage or going to the doctor, but it's that overthinking and, and staying in that realm. It's finding respite in our practice. It allows us to rest the mind and heart. I ask you to touch your heart before becoming overwhelmed. It brings about stillness of the mind and clarity. It helps us to connect with our emotions, recognizing when we are one way or the other, 
and it's an opportunity to see our fel- ourselves truly the way we are, <clears throat> our true spirits. <clears throat> so I've quoted the Buddha a couple of times. And um, one of the things I want to say is that I'll do one more quote, and that's a Dalai Lama before I before I talk about this. The Dalai Lama says, um, we should not see equanimity as an end in itself, nor should we feel that we are striving for a total state of apathy in which we have no feelings or fluctuating emotions towards either our enemies or our loved ones. That is not what we're seeking to achieve. What we aspire to achieve is, first of all, to set the foundation, to have a clear field where we can then plant our thoughts. Equanimity is the even ground that we are first laying out. Remember I talked about the roots, the steady roots? On the basis of this, we should then reflect on the merits of tolerance. The merits of tolerance, patience, love, and compassion towards all. And this is a quote from The Good Heart, a Buddhist perspective on the teachings of Jesus. And that way I'm going to segue into something else that I want to say this evening. One of the things I want to point out, even though I've quoted uh, the Buddha and quoted teachers, is that these qualities are not unique to Buddhism. Rather, they are found and embraced in every culture. And I don't know every religious practice or every culture, but I can guarantee you there's some form, even if the Pali words are not used. It's what allowed you to survive. It's what allowed you to survive to be here at this time. It's what allowed our ancestors, wherever they came from, whether they came here voluntarily or whether they were stolen and brought here, whether they came here by accident, it's what allowed them to survive generation after generation after generation. Some sense of balance, some sense of connectedness with who their true nature is. So it allowed us to survive slave ships, immigrant boats tossing about the seas, pilgrimages, migrations, forced migrations along like the te- Trail of Tears, cattle trains to death camps, being placed in internment camps. Our ancestors had their own way of practicing equanimity and modeling that for their family and their loved ones many times so they wouldn't panic, so they would feel some sense of survival. This modeling they were able to transmit to others again, so you could be here today. Their sense of equanimity and all of the divine abodes, love, loving kindness, happiness for you when you had things to celebrate, compassion when you were in pain, all of these have been cultivated in some form. Equanimity was demonstrated during the civil rights marches at lunch counter sit-ins when students were taunted and faced with violence. They practice in advance, cultivating equanimity, gathering in churches and singing before going out to marches, strengthening themselves, bringing about that balance. They had to be equanimous. I once saw, I didn't really get some of this about having fear and calmness at the same time until I saw an old clip of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was in a march, I think it was in Selma or it might have been his last march in Memphis. And he was walking along being buoyed and held by a couple of people. And then he flinched because he heard a loud noise and he flinched thinking it might be a gunshot. And I remember thinking, oh, In the face of all of this steadfastness, he is frightened. He is frightened and he kept on marching. John Lewis, the late Senator John Lewis, made it a point to smile in his mugshots when he was arrested out of a sense of defiance, but also saying, sending a message to himself and to everyone else, 
that he's balancing out these things that have been done to him, these injustices. He's surviving, and so would we, and we could too. So we have a lot of people to draw on, whether we knew them, whether they're blood ancestors, whether they're um, our blood relatives, friends, or spiritual ancestors. We have them as models, and we've always had them. They've been able to hold us gently and lead us back home. Equanimity has two arms to hold all the joys and the sorrow. And in the Zen tradition, we sometimes talk, and I'll end with this, and we refer to this as grandmother mind or grandmother heart. Okay? A grandmother loves her children and grandchildren with openness and strength and does it with a strong back and a soft front. So when we say grandmother mind or grandmother heart, it's that strong back. And I'm generalizing, maybe some grandmothers weren't like this, but it's, it's an imagery. It embraces with compassion, openness, non-judgment, stability. And the support that comes from that stability is like, keeps us upright, like the bamboo or the ship's ballast. It steadies us. When we foster an understanding of all of the winds, all the changes, we're able to ride those waves. Dukkha happens, disaster, loss, all of these will continue. And we can pull on our learning, our teaching, that toolbox to remind ourselves that we can work with equanimity. Selecting an environment where friends or equanimous, limiting overexposure to sorrows and violence and all that vicarious trauma, turning it off and finding that place that you found maybe during your meditation. It could have been a garden or the ocean or a, a grove, or it could be in a comfortable room in front of a fire with your loved ones or your pets. Finding that place that brings you balance and stressing the importance of being around. I'm going to say again, people that embody this. Thich Nhat Hanh, when he spoke to the uh, uh, refugees from Southeast Asia and he asked them you know, about their experiences, he confirmed, talking to all of them, that it only took one calm person on the boat to save everyone. If one person panicked, so did the others. Freedom comes when we let go of our reactive tendencies. <laughs> And I'll leave you with these thoughts uh, that we can come home to equanimity at any time. Silence, spaciousness, rest, got to rest and settle, meditation and practice. So with that, I will um, stop there and uh, rest. Hopefully you can rest with those thoughts. And I'll open it up so that we have a little bit of time for either questions. And then I believe when we end at 7.30, as we come close to an end, I'll uh, do a dedication for everyone. So mm -hmm. I'll leave that to the end. Does that work, Art? That works fine, uh, okay. Anne. Uh, should we ask for people to raise their hand and I'll unmute them? Yes, if you yes. could do that, that would be good. And I won't be able to answer all, but perhaps there are some collective uh, questions or wisdom that mm -hmm. that we see. I can't see all of the messages. So please, if you do have questions for Anne, if you'd raise use the raised hand feature. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have Liz here. Liz, thank you, Liz. There ah. we go. Okay, so uh, thank you. So um, I'm kind of fascinated by something you said that I almost never hear and that I've been thinking about lately. You said, may I rest in not knowing. Mm -hmm. Want to elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. We are so obsessed with knowledge of knowing everything. I think of it. <laughs> and the reason I laugh is because I remember during uh, <clears throat> the last, the last election, perhaps, 
how people I know were just running to the television every two seconds to see if the polls were moving. What did Arizona do? What did Massachusetts do? This obsession with being, having our finger on the pulse all the time of knowing, wanting to know what's going to happen to us, what's going to happen to the future. And also feeling like we have to have an answer. I've been a college teacher. I, I function in a leadership role in many settings, whether it's board. And I'm learning that it's okay to say, I don't know. I don't know, and I'm going to rest with it. I might someday, but I can't force the knowing. So it's feeling comfortable or coming to terms or making friends with not knowing everything because so much suffering is caused chasing this knowledge that we may never unravel or never find out. It doesn't cut down inquiry or investigation or research, but it's that clinging. Okay, that's the difference that causes the suffering, that clinging to knowing and having to have the answer. Does that help? Yes, a lot. I, I've just, I'm, I'm pretty old and I'm just coming into the space of really being quite delighted by not knowing. <laughs> okay. It's so liberating. Yeah, I love and, to say it. Someone, I love to say, I don't know, but I'll see if I can find out. I think, I think what, I think one needs to have a lot of maturity and equanimity to come to the spot of not knowing. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else want to raise their hand? This is the time. Yeah. I may not know. <laughs> and I'm comfortable not knowing. I don't see another hand. Oh, oh okay. George. Okay. okay. Hi, George. Hi. Thank you for your talk. Um, I've experienced a lot of helpful uh, lessening of suffering with equanimity. And would you talk a little bit more about such as uh, Martin Luther King might have had equanimity and be a very balanced person, but he also eventually took action and balanced out. So what I found is equanimity helps me in the moment. Uh, and it seems to be my next step is to once I have that evenness of mind is to take action, uh, wise action. Uh, or could you speak more about that? Sure. One of the, yeah, that great question. One of the things, and I'm not a scholar of Martin Luther King, um, <clears throat> especially having grown up in Canada, we knew of Martin Luther King, so I wasn't part of marches or anything. But one of the things we want to stress with equanimity, it doesn't mean non-action. Okay, it, it what it means is non-reactivity. So with equanimity, with recognizing the fear, recognizing agency and capacity, then we know how to respond and we take action. But it's that pause, that measured pause. What is going? What are the causes and conditions? What can I influence? What can I impact? Some, so it's, it's knowing, it's in that knowing, it's in prayer, it's in silence, it's in meditation that we find that equilibrium. And sometimes mistakes are made. When I say mistakes, sometimes the learning, we have to, you know, we learn from the reactivity. How many times have you said, oh, I wish I hadn't said that, or I wish, you know, we don't dwell on the regret, but it's that bending over that makes us know we have to come back. So I think it's important to remember that there's energy and warmth with the response that's different from reactivity. There's energy and warmth with responding and taking action in a informed way through mindfulness. I hope that helps. Yes, thank you. Exclusive. I see Meredith's hand up and I'm watching the time here. Okay, we're good. Meredith. Yeah, hi. Um, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Let's Meredith. Let's see. Thank you. Um, it occurred to me as you were talking and I was doing my best to find equanimity within me. It seems to me that it, um, I guess the only way I can think of it right away is it like cuts through shame. It's, uh, that's how I felt. Um, and it reminds me of, where did you go up on a roof or something? 
you know, and you can see more and it's, uh, it's clearer. I don't know if it was clearer up on your roof, but, um, um, shame tends to hold my attention mm -hmm. and, um, uh, equanimity, I don't know, I'm just doing this by intuition, but, you know, equanimity feels like it recognizes shame, but doesn't take shame as seriously as shame takes itself. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, <laughs> part, <laughs> it's part of what is seen, understood, you know. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for that teaching, so Meredith. Been very Thank helpful. you. Thank you. The, the shame... <laughs> keeps us where? Rooted in the past, right? Rooted in the mm -hmm. past, not opening up that spaciousness for loving kindness, for giving ourselves a break and saying that was then, it, it you know, so it roots us in that, that so much in the past that we're not able to be present. But you have a beautiful teaching on your own there, Meredith, through your, <laughs> through your wisdom. Okay, Thanks. so I'm, I'm looking at the, I won't be able to answer them all. I'm uh, we're 729 Pacific, and um, I can, uh, uh, is it uh, Bra Brahmavar? I don't see other, any other hands I see hands one right hand now. up, and I don't want hmm. to ignore it, so we'll do a quick question, and then I'll do the dedication. You would have right. to unmute if uh, you want to speak. I don't see that on my screen. Uh, it's Anne. a physical hand, okay. but Brahmavar, maybe you can put it in chat since we're running out of time. Yeah. And yeah, because I I can see your mouth moving, but I can't hear you. Hmm. Okay, so feel yeah. free to put your question in chat if you're able to do that. Okay, and. Um... I'm not able to hear. So to um oh, can you hear me? Yes. Can uh -huh. you, there we go. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I am so happy you lived in Atlanta. I am from Georgia. I want to tell that I became so Georgia is always on my mind. <laughs> I lived there for 30 years. Okay. Well, <laughs> I know I, John. I used to live in Georgia. And, and what my, Right now in Savannah, yeah. but right now I'm in San Rafael across the Golden Gate Bridge in Marin County. But yeah. thank you yeah. and welcome. Yes, yeah. I and also I... Moved, to, I moved to Bay Area. I am a Hindu, but I'm a passionate Buddhist. Oh, lovely. In thank my you. understanding, mm -hmm. in my understanding, equanimity is, for example, put three people one you love, one you have little difficulty to get along those kind of people, when you don't know at all. Put three yeah. people, how everybody in life wants happiness. They want to be happy, et cetera, et cetera. How to love these kind of people for giving those kind of good quality. So we have to accept and love people whom we love, whom we don't know, whom we have problem. That is the meaning of my understanding of equanimity. And that is correct. And you can Thank do that you. with all of the Brahma Viharas, a neutral person, yourself, someone that you're having difficulty with. But thank you. And we'll go on to do the. Thank you so much. I'm glad you could unmute. So I'm going to dedicate um, the merit of all that was generated in this Sangha to our own liberation and that of others. May we all have ease. May we all have insight, spaciousness. May we continue to be rooted in those roots that support our practice. And may we be able to weather the winds of change, the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows.